my great pleasure to introduce David Cullen, uh, who's Professor of Bioanalytical Technology at the Centre for Biomedical Engineering School of Aerospace in Cranfield. Uh, David works on biosensors for a range of medical and environmental problems, and he's going to talk to us now about the life marker chip and other technologies for in situ evidence of life detection. Okay, David. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the first thing is my affiliation is very subtly changed. As you can see, I'm now in the space group at Cranfield because of some kind of uh, uh, kind of structural changes at Cranfield. I'm still at Cranfield, but but now in a slightly different group. Um, so I suppose the reason I'm here for is given in the title of this talk, in that myself and Mark Sims, that some of you know from the University of Leicester. Uh, co-proposed and then led the life marker chip instrument development for ExoMars for a number of years and of course that instrument was uh, based around the idea of detecting evidence of uh, extinct life uh, on Mars uh, and so obviously within the context of kind of trying to understand and contextualize the possibility of life uh, on other body on other, other planets um, so this is what I'm planning to do just to give you another quick slide to uh, give you an idea of kind of what things I've been involved in. Uh, a couple of slides to explain why I'm here in Iceland at the moment, because it is relevant, I think, uh, to kind of this talk. And then I've got quite a lot of slides, but I'll quickly zip through them just to give an overview of what the life market ship is, um, uh, and basically using immunoassays in plant exploration, and then try and get the balance right so that I spend some time thinking about the issues of going from uh, or using the LMC on Mars versus icy moons and some of the differences that that, 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 that kind of, uh, kind of uh, throws up. And then at the end, I've got a couple of slides just to get, whoops, sorry, forward. just a couple of slides to give my very simple top level view of uh, a range of, of obvious life detection uh, instruments and approaches, and then briefly mention in a, one or two slides another experiment that we've just uh, 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 it's just been accepted. This is, or at least, uh, kind of my Cranfield's involvement in a uh, DLR Germany-led um, uh, experiment to go on the ISS uh, that is again uh, icy moons ecosystem related. So next slide is just to kind of give a, a, a background, a bit more of a background about myself. So as you've heard, I started off in the kind of biomedical environmental sector, stumbled into the space sector about 15 years ago um, by meeting up Mark, with Mark Sims and ending up proposing the life market chip using immunoassays, things we'd already been using to detect trace organics, trace organic pollutants here on Earth in environmental samples, and of course detecting evidence of life on Mars could be reduced to the simple question of can you detect certain trace chemicals in the Martian environment. Um, so that's how I got in. Um, uh, we did some work showing that immunoassay reagents could survive in space, flying them on the ESA Biopan mission, which I'll very briefly talk about. Also then got involved in taking out into icy kind of environments here on Earth uh, a whole range of uh, life detection uh, instruments uh, to various kind of glaciers uh, uh, in Norway and Greenland, uh, and more recently doing similar things as you'll see in the next slide for lava fields. And of course, these have got obvious kind of uh, relevance to uh, to to, the, to this this meeting. Done some work with stratospheric balloons, and more recently got involved with CubeSat, the Ice Cube uh, experiment. I'm going to talk about at the very end uh, is a CubeSat-like payload that will go on the outside of the ISS, uh, and we're also looking at uh, having free flying CubeSats to do a combination of astrobiology and also biomedical experiments um, inside these. So one of our taglines is to, use, is to fly humans on CubeSats, basically as a mammalian cell culture. So uh, just, I think, one slide looking at what we're doing here in Iceland. Um, so we have an acronym for this. Um, but the key thing is, sorry if this is a bit small, uh, but what we're trying to do is to simulate what happens in planetary rover operations? In the kind of we env we envisage, envisage those as having three levels of analytical decision making. The first one um, is to have the, the the 
the non-contact contact, so the non-contact context measurements um, to decide where then to physically sample. And so for this field trip, what we have is a range of things which mimic that. So we have UAVs from Georgia Tech, so this is a, a multi-national uh, uh, kind of group. We have visible reflective spectroscopy from JPL, Raman spectroscopy from Cranfield, uh, and also some in situ kind of temperature measurements. Uh, so that gives us the ability to look at an environment and decide where we want to do the next stage, which is the contact measurements. That's where we would expect to decide to collect a sample, process it, do some analysis, and with techniques that have limited sample numbers that can be processed. So in red, I've highlighted the techniques we're using here, and they're in red because clearly they're not relevant to a current Mars science case because these are very clearly looking for Earth extant life. And again, I'll mention this towards the end, some of the issues of this. So we have ATP bioluminescence, real-time PCR. We've got a single molecule DNA sequencing kit with us, although because that arrived quite late, we're actually not going to be using that on this field campaign, but that's some of the kind of leading analytical technology now available, a literally uh, kind of small handheld um, single molecule DNA sequencing techniques uh, are now emerging. And then, within, the, the, within this context, we're then looking to take samples back to institutional laboratories, what would be the equivalent of Mars sample return. And what we're trying to do here is to have multiple cycles, certainly the first two, in a single field campaign to try and simulate what happens in a typical um, uh, planetary exploration mission where you have um, a limited time to get or to get data, then make decisions about where what that means next in terms of where you sample. So we're trying to simulate those cycles uh, of, of activity. In this case, then leading up to decisions about which samples to take back to um, institutional laboratories, as I said, capturing the mass sample return. So this is a continuation of what we started in 2013. We published that uh, recently. Um, and looking to continue this in 2016, so we're planning to go to the Badabunga lava field site. So that's a very recent site, in fact, literally only become accessible easily over the past few months. Um, the field site we are using at the moment, at the very top here, um, was created in 2010 uh, as part of the kind of large eruption um, uh, that happened in 2010 here in Iceland. And we've done similar work. Um, perhaps not with all these techniques, but in the past in glacial environments and certainly looking to do things similar in the future. So that's why we're here in Iceland and that's a, that, that, that continues. We were here this week and we're here next week as well. The other reason we're here for is that this is running alongside a Nordic, um, uh, or rather, yeah, Nordic kind of youth um, organized by the University of Hawaii in this kind of uh, Nordic network, as far as network. A graduate summer school is happening here, uh, and we're kind of running in parallel with that, or partly in parallel with that, um, so that um, uh, so that the students can actually see firsthand what we're doing. Right, so now to try and summarize quickly what the life market chip is, for those of you who are not familiar with it, so this is really the, 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 the top level view. So we have the ExoMars rover, which is why it was kind of, a, uh, or, or what was the basis of being developed. In the top corner, you see a CAD representation of the life market chip. I'll explain a bit more in the next couple of slides. And in the bottom corner here, you have a pregnancy test device, simply because the fundamental technique that we use in the life market chip immunoassays is exactly the same technology that present pregnancy test devices and in fact actually formatted in a very similar way, um, which we'll see in the next couple of slides. So, uh, overview again, you see another CAD representation. So what the LMC is, or at least on ExoMars, and remember that these, this is a description of LMC as it was packaged for ExoMars, and it doesn't necessarily have to be packaged in the same way for other missions. But for, Ex for ExoMars, it ended up being an instrument that could detect or analyze only four discrete samples, each sample was to be about one gram of crushed Martian sample delivered by the XMR sample uh, processing distribution system. The LMC then had four single-use analytical pathways or modules, obviously each one analyzing a single uh, Martian sample. Each one of those four single-use analytical pathways or modules had these kind of th these kind of top-level steps. First of all, 
organic molecule extraction from those dried crushed samples um, using a liquid solvent, and again I'll talk about this later because it's a key aspect of the LMC, a liquid solvent. That liquid extract was then fed into another part of the system where this multiplexed immunoassay happened. That meant multiplex simply means that we were detecting more than one chemical target structure per um, kind of uh, analytical system. In fact, we would detect up to 25 different targets all multiplexed together into, into a single uh, assay. Uh, again, for XMRs, just under five kilos, you can see the dimensions there. There's a, there's a slide next which will kind of just help you visualize that. And because we're using uh, kind of aqueous based solvents, then the internal analytical pathways were all above zero degrees C and all pressurized to greater than 200 millibars uh, pressure to allow us to handle liquid, uh, stable liquid water. Uh, just to help you visualize it, so this is a one to one uh, scale 3D printed model. You can see a pen in the foreground, somebody's hand in the background, just to kind of drive home the size. This strange L shaped format was, was simply to make, take advantage of the volume envelope that was available within the animal draw of the ExoMart uh, uh, instrument payload. So again, that we wouldn't have to be of that form in, in a future implementation. So quickly to emphasize what how the LMC actually works, which I'll go straight through to this. So what you see here um, is an early version of what's in the cartoon form represented in, in the background here. So at this point here, liquid extract comes into this analytical subsystem. It goes through it goes through this pad here, or this kind of long white feature here, which is equivalent to this area here. It then goes into this chamber here, which is equivalent to this area here, and then this is the exit to waste port for the liquid sample. And again, you can see the dimensions here, and this is just a more complicated microfluidic system that was getting closer to the flight model version before um, uh, the instrument was being selected, which again I'll talk about in, in a few minutes. So very briefly, what happens is liquid sample here, containing in this case a target molecule, an analyte we're trying to measure, gets flowed into this channel. This area here has dried down molecular reagents, in this case antibodies, these Y-shaped cartoon representation of antibodies with a little red dot, some kind of fluorescent, in this case a fluorescent dye. And of course antibodies, these, these protein-based molecular reagents, have the ability to recognize particular chemical structures and bind them. And the, another key thing is that if you want to detect a particular target, in this case an analyte called A, then you develop an antibody that recognizes that. If you have a completely different chemical structure in here, say B, you would raise or develop an antibody that had a different binding site that recognized molecule B and didn't recognize molecule A. Uh, and that's the reason why you can then multi multiplex these together. So liquid sample comes in, dissolves up, and then if there's any of this A target present, it can bind to the binding sites on these antibodies. And we then carry on flushing this through to this area here, where we have copies of the target molecule immobilized somehow the structure of the device. So what happens is as this liquid reagent comes through, or this mixture now of sample um, extract plus the antibodies comes through, if there are any unoccupied binding sites on these antibodies still left, they can bind to these immobilized copies of the target. And we then carry on flushing away the rest of the reagents. And then all we do is measure the amount of this fluorescent dye that's present in this region of the device. And actually, we get an inverse relationship. The more of this target that's present, the more of these antibody binding sites which are occupied, and the less number of antibodies can bind in this region, bringing the label with them, and vice versa. If we have very low levels, then we see a large amount of antibody binding. And so we relate that with a whole series of controls and, and such uh, back to working out the original concentration of those targets in this liquid extract, and therefore back into the original dried crushed sample. And just to visualize the end result, um, so actually if we go back in here, in these little chambers here, 
or in the near flight model version of these little chambers here. What we had immobilized, these areas here, are actually immobilized as a series of small um, uh, dots of reagents, uh, such that we have what we call microarrays. And so each one of these dots will correspond to a different immunoassay. And so we, in fact, image the fluorescence come off, coming off of these little microarrays. Uh, and as I'm trying to indicate here, we look for different intensities of light coming off of these to then interpret that back to the concentration of the targets uh, in the original sample. So, uh, just to try and quickly finish off this bit about the LMC, uh, before I talk about the difference between Mars and IT moons in using the LMC, this is more or less one of the key stages we got to with the LMC development before um, uh, uh, the kind of development slowed. Uh, so this is the end-to-end the -end breadboard version that currently exists at the University of Leicester with a sample extraction, the analysis, uh, gas pressurization, uh, some fluid pumping, uh, that's it. So, so hardware-wise, that's one of the key stages we got to just before we were going to go into the flight model build. We got a full design for the flight model, but never got as far as actually building it. I'll come back briefly in a, in a couple of minutes to uh, issues about the targets, but this just emphasizes in the top corner, in the top corner, the top uh, left-hand corner, if you want the science case, we, have, we divide the molecular targets into five categories internal controls and contamination, but then the three main science uh, categories, uh, well, that two main science categories, was looking for abiotics, the meteoritic infall signals which we should see um, uh, on the Mars surface at the moment, and of course the most likely scenario for the samples we were looking at the ExoMars, looking for markers of extinct life. Also had the possibility to look for extant life markers as well, but obviously in, in the current Mars context that's not particularly relevant. Um, and this just gives the history, so uh, I've already said, uh, we proposed the idea in 2013 um, because of lots of delays and such, the significant funding kicked in in 2008, uh, launch is still scheduled for 2018, although possibly not to slip, uh, but then because of all the changes in the mission, uh, come mid-2012, it became apparent that there was going to need to be a significant deselection of instruments from the payload as it was then, such that come 2013 it was all confirmed that the LNC together with a number of other instruments were deselected as the uh, ExoMars rover had to revert back to a smaller ESA rover after having a few years with a much larger NASA uh, We also proposed the LNC as part of, and I'll come back to solid in a minute, Spanish-led uh, proposal in 2013 for the NASA 2020 mission, but didn't get selected because of obviously the, the, the changes in the focus of that, really looking at caching um, rather than a lot of in situ science. So I think that summarizes the LMC. What I now want to do is start thinking about some of the issues that would change between going from Mars to an icy moon context. So, really, four points. The top one here is just to remind everybody that the LMC is one of two very similar instruments that's been developed. Uh, Spanish, uh, a Spanish group is leading something called the Science of Life Detector Solid uh, that fundamentally is the same as the LMC, it's an antibody-based microarray, although their development path has been slightly different in that they have focused uh, more on uh, kind of Earth analog applications uh, with, a, uh, with more of an extant Earth life focus on targets, whereas the LMC, I guess, uh, if we simplify it, has been focusing more on a flight model development and an extinct Mars uh, kind of sample set. Um, so really, I'm going to now talk about kind of four things briefly. Sample processing, radiation stability, target selection, and then the ability to generate antibodies. So sample processing for ExoMars was simply this. This is us simulating it in the laboratory. So solid samples crushed. Of the ExoMars rock crusher, uh, and then we differ in that we do this low temperature liquid phase extraction, including using ultrasonics, ultrasonic probe, and then filtration or intensification to generate aqueous based extracts. And the key thing with that, so in the ExoMars context, is that I'm sure most of the audience is familiar with the issues the chlorate on Mars and what that has meant for the current and previous. 
organics detection experiments on Mars, which are typically used pyrolysis to, uh, to process the sample to liberate organics. The key thing about the LMC, as I've already said, is that this uses, in fact, this solvent at the moment, an 80% water, methanol, and some surfactants, together with ultrasonics, to extract both polar and apolar compounds from crushed market samples at much less than 100 degrees C. We've shown that that's reasonably efficient. And the key thing is that we've shown that if we uh, fight samples with phoenix landing site levels of the chlorate salts, and then do the extraction, two things happen. One, we don't see any degradation of the organics. And secondly, um, the immunoassays still function even with that chlorex feeding all the way through, it gets extracted into the liquid extract. Uh, so therefore, having this very different type of processing um, means that we can analyze the presence of chlorates. And for icy moons, uh, the, the key thing there is that assuming we have an aqueous based sample, then it changes the sample processing. What we will need to do almost certainly is a combination of, of, of filtration and extraction, I'll mention this very briefly in the slide later, some of the issues. So it changes the sample processing uh, fundamentally, but still will uh, uh, kind of allow a lot of heritage from many similar applications here on Earth to be transferred across to the IC moment situation. So the second thing, radiation. And of course, what the key thing here, we're not worried about the hardware of the instrumentation that's been dealt with elsewhere. The concern here is flying molecular assay reagents on planetary exploration missions. It really hasn't been done before. And our concern there is the effect of the radiation environment and whether there's a need for extra shielding to protect those molecular reagents, which for most of the kind of bioassays will be protein-like um, uh, materials as well as some, some chemicals. So for ExoMars, the LMC, <clears throat> We got quite early involved, or early on involved in forming this. So the reason this is here for in the top corner here, certainly in, in yellow, is the ESA Biopan facility. So we flew antibodies and other immunoassay reagents in Biopan in 2007 to show they could survive um, uh, in the environment that they were exposed to in this situation. Uh, so this is the experiment, simply a container. We had it's opened up. You can see these little glass like had freeze-dried antibodies and fluorescent dyes into these, closed it up, it basically went to ESA, got down to the fire pan, um, this exposure facility, taken out to Iconor, mounted on the outside of the re-entry capsule orbiter, launched two weeks in low Earth orbit with this container open, exposing the samples in this experiment here to space radiation, closed, brought back to Earth, analyzed the sample see whether they survive post-flight. Ignore most of the text in red. That simply said that uh, they survived an ExoMars relevant uh, environment. Uh, in red is where it becomes relevant to icy moons. So the key thing is that we also, as part of the ExoMars work, did a lot of ground-based radiation testing, uh, uh, cyclotrons, or synchrotrons, um, the proton and neutron beam lines. And the key thing there was ExoMars uh, mission relatively benign in terms of radiation. But obviously, if we go into Europa, this is just some data I took from the uh, Jupiter Europa orbiter, they are looking at 2.9 megarads total dose behind 2.5 meters of aluminium for a nine month Europa orbit phase. If we then translate that to some of the over testing we did at ExoMars, we did a 250 times ExoMars dose, which worked out to be about 1.6 megarads behind, uh, behind aluminium, and we saw significant antibody activity loss. So it suggests that any experiment or instruments that's looking to fly bioassay type reagents um, uh, to icy boots and Europa, you almost certainly need to consider shielding to allow um, those to survive. So that's, that's one key aspect. Um, so the third thing is target selection. So th this is some work we did kind of in 2006, um, leading up to the LMC, trying to decide what we need to detect. And the reason for this is 
what well, will come clear in a minute, is that we must pre-decide what the analytical targets are that we're going to try and measure. Uh, then we need to develop antibodies to detect those, and we need to make sure they don't cross-react with other relevant targets and have relevant binding affinity and be compatible with the assay environment. But the key thing here is that we must pre-decide what we're going to detect, which isn't true for things like PC aspect. And the other aspect of this is that when you do decide, and this is some of the kind of targets we were looking at, some of these structures, especially the ones towards the top of this slide, become actually very challenging to produce antibodies against. And just to speed up a bit, that's another key message, is that depending upon what the targets are, which as I said before, have to be predetermined before you fly, that some of those, especially in the uh, uh, Mars extinct life case, can actually be quite challenging. That became a major aspect of the LMC project was developing or trying to develop the antibodies using quite advanced antibody development techniques to produce those. So just to kind of wrap up, a couple of slides just to summarize uh, certainly my top level view of other uh, uh, sorry, other light detection techniques. And I suppose they fall into two forms. So I've got two slides. This one, which is looking at techniques that are readily available, but which are very clearly biased to Earth life. And then a second slide, looking at things which are perhaps haven't got that earth sense bias. So what we have in the first top level bullet point is a whole variety of different analytical techniques, most of which, all of them, I think, we've implemented in the field, uh, either on this field campaign or other ones which are detecting things like ATP, lipid polysaccharide, nucleic acid sequences, and so on. But of course, all of those are developed for non-space application and developed because they work with Earth life. Uh, and therefore, they're all focused for obviously the single genesis of life that we know, the single biochemistry of life on Earth. And so it's worth just thinking what that means in terms of these, the use of these elsewhere in the solar system. So the first thing is that the time of targets we're looking at are unlikely to be st stable over geological time scale, so therefore they very clearly focus on ant life. Um, they are clearly relevant to understanding contemporary Earth life in the context of colonization, contamination, or use elsewhere in the solar system. They are clearly relevant if we have a hypothesis we want to test, which is that there's a common genesis of life throughout the solar system, in other words, it's all the same biochemistry, and of course would be relevant if there is a hypothesis that says that Earth's life choice of these molecules, there is some fundamental reason why other independent genesis of life would also select these, then clearly that they would be relevant to that as well. But obviously that, that, that isn't a well-supported kind of, uh, view at the moment. And this is the other kind of category. So those which are not biased towards Earth life, we clearly have the, what I call the classic chemical spectroscopy, see mass spec. We also have other versions. Uh, I mentioned here Yuri. Part of that is because we have here in this field campaign Amanda Stockton from Georgia Tech, who is continuing the development work of the capillary electrophoresis system that's present in Yuri, and that isn't particularly focused towards Earth life. We have microscopes, and I believe we've got a talk elsewhere. Uh, looking or have had a talk on really compact um, microscopic system. Clearly that would be relevant, either direct microscopy or with some cost enhancement. We have the obvious case again of metabolic activity, we have Viking, and of course we can easily see modern variants of that. And as I mentioned before, sample processing uh, for icy moons is clearly um, different than it on Mars. And then the last thing is just to mention this ice cube uh, experiment. So this is a cube satellite payload that will be mounted on the outside of the ISS. And the key thing about the CubeSat bit is that it means that we can do in-situ monitoring during a long exposure of what will be a uh, icy moon type ecosystem. Uh, and we'll be looking at the evolution of that um, um, as it's mounted on the outside of the, uh, uh, or during its, its life on the outside of the ISS exposed to kind of space radiation in low Earth orbit. Um, and I'm just one of the co-investigators on that. It's being led out of DLR, and uh, this was uh, selected a couple of months ago, part of the uh, ILSRA 14 core 
um, is now going through a, a definition. So with that, hopefully you said so about half an hour. Um, hopefully I've gone over that, um, and I'm happy to try and answer any question. Do we have any questions for Dave? Uh, David Duckhoney from the NFC. Um, any thoughts towards pre-concentration steps in these systems to give a higher sensitivity? Yes. So, in the case of of the water or, or kind of um, kind of uh, glacial icy environments work done in the past, it's relatively straightforward. If we have ice and we melt, and then there's two separate uh, kind of strands that can be focused. One is then particle filter to concentrate the particulates if the assumption is, as often is the case with kind of uh, ice samples in glaciers, that the major, a large part of the life within a glacier is present on mineral particles within the glacier. So we then filter out the particle phase or fraction and then analyze that. So we take a few liters of melted ice, filter down and uh, onto kind of uh, swarm, uh, uh, particle filter membranes and then extract off those into sub milliliter fractions. Or, of course, the other way, if we're looking at the dissolved um, kind of molecular component, would be solid phase extraction. So, to basically pass a large volume across a, a solid, a high surface area, solid phase extraction, cartridge type uh, situation, where depending upon what the surface physical chemistry properties are, we can then partition out and concentrate onto that surface hydrophobic, charged compounds, whatever, and then, of course, extract off into a much smaller volume to give us the concentration before they then go into uh, whatever the analytical system is that, 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 that um, you're intending to use. Anybody else? No? Um, David, thanks very much for joining us from uh, Iceland, and um, have a good weekend, I guess. Uh, it's a busy, busy weekend.